intervertebral disc prolapse. What is the etiology of intervertebral disc prolapse? In 80% of uh, cases, this is the etiology. What is this? Severe flexion strain. As uh, this woman try to carry a heavy object or bag from the ground. Uh, this is a common cause. Why? Because uh, during flexion strain, the intervertebral disc consists of two parts. Central part called nucleus bulbosus, which is gelatinous material, surrounded by laminated fibrous tissue called annulus fibrosus. During flexion of the vertebral column, severe flexion strain, this will compress the anterior part of the nucleus bulbosus pushing the nucleus bulbosus backward and the posterior part of annulus fibrosus becomes stretched compressed and this may lead to tach, rupture of the posterior part of annulus fibrosus with herniation of the nucleus bulbosus into the vertebral canal or spinal canal and this is is called intervertebral disc blowups in 20 percent of cases uh, intervertebral disc blowups may occur due to old age due to degeneration of the intervertebral disc what is the pathology of intervertebral disc prolapse? First of all, the commonest level to be affected by intervertebral disc prolapse in about 80% of cases is the disc intervertebral disc between L4, L5, and S1 lumbar vertebral disc prolapse is the commonest disc between L4, 5, S1. About 20% may occur in the cervical region. Disc between C5, C6, and C7. What is the intervertebral disc prolapse? Intervertebral disc prolapse, the intervertebral disc consists of a central gelatinous material called the nucleus bulbosus surrounded by laminated fibrous tissue called annulus fibrosus. Um, annulus because it is laminated. Fibrosus consists of fibrous tissue. Intervertebral disc prolapse is actually herniation of uh, the central gelatinous material, which is nucleus bulbosus, through the annulus fibrosus. And the herniation usually occur in the spinal canal, usually. Um, what is the direction of uh, herniation? Usually, the direction of herniation is posterior or posterolateral. If posterolateral herniation, posterolateral herniation will affect the spinal nerve roots, compressing the spinal nerve roots. But if compression is posterior, like this, this is the intervertebral disc and the nucleus bulbosus herniates through the annulus fibrosus in posterior direction. This will affect and compress the anterior part of the spinal cord. 
very rarely the intervertebral disc may herniate toward the vertebral body toward the vertebral body leading to a nodule called Schmolz nodule Schmolz nodule nodule projecting into the body of the vertebrae called the Schmolz nodule therefore the herniation may be posterior affecting the anterior part of the spinal cord or the anterior part of the spine according to the label or on posterior lateral direction affecting and compressing the nerve roots um, what is uh, the complications of uh, intervertebral disc prolapse um, sure the main complication is compression of nerve roots or compression of the spinal cord this is the most serious plus if uh, intervertebral disc prolapse occur and uh, the body of the adjacent vertebrae becomes adherent together this leads to osteoarthritis of the intervertebral joint what is the clinical picture of intervertebral disc prolapse according to the level in lumbar vertebral disc prolapse there is a clear history of sudden severe flexion strain followed by ah, severe back pain the intervertebral disc prolapse irritate the compressed nerves leading to severe spasm of muscles of the back leading to severe back pain and the compressed nerve roots in the lumbar region may lead to sciatica because sciatic nerve arise from L4 5 S1 2 3 um, and the commonest level of uh, lumbar vertebral disc prolapse is disc between L4 L5 S1 therefore this is usually affect the nerve roots sharing in the sciatic nerve leading to sciatic uh, the pain is characteristically increased by flexion of the trunk and increased by raising the leg straight and this is a famous uh, clinical test called straight leg test elevating the straight leg while the sciatic nerve is stretched may lead to severe pain in the gluteal region and the back of the side and the leg um, the patient uh, try to minimize and reduce pressure on the affected nerve roots how by lumbar scoliosis if uh, you tilt your trunk to one side against the side of the vein on the opposite side this will lead to widening of the intervertebral foramina and widening of intervertebral foramina will give space for the nerve root to be released from the vein therefore there may be limbing and the lumbar lordosis to reduce the compression on the nerve root and reduce pain sure motor and sensory examination should be done to detect any sensory or motor affection due to compression of the spinal cord or compression of coda equina or motor paralysis or compression of spinal cord in case of cervical disc prolapse in case of cervical disc prolapse sure there is been there is been along the affected compressed nerve roots and in the cervical region this is the origin of the brachial plexus from C5, 6, 7, 8, T1 and 
the compressed nerve root leading to radiating pain in the arm and forearm. If there is a friction of the spinal cord, according to if there is compression of half of the spinal cord, this leads to the famous syndrome, which is called brown sequard syndrome. Or if there is compression of the anterior part of the spinal cord with a friction of the corticospinal fibers, which are the pyramidal fibers, this may lead to quadriplegia. What is the differential diagnosis of lumbar vertebral disc prolapse? Other swellings or other lesion in the vertebral column producing root compression or spinal cord compression, like spinal cord tumor or vertebral tumor or the famous disease in the vertebral column, which is TB of spine, which is called the Bott's disease of the spine. Investigations, the main investigation, sure, as we take in fracture spine, is CT scan and the MRI. But also, brain x ray show, brain x ray show what? This is lateral view, brain x ray, please compare the space between the two vertebrae. This is the intervertebral space. Normal disc leading to normal space, but is, uh, give me by your opinion here. Here, due to intervertebral disc prolapse, there is narrowing of the intervertebral space. Plus, secondary osteoarthritis leading to osteophytes in the vertebral margins. And brain X-ray is important to exclude bone tumor compressing the spinal cord or nerve roots. More important is CT scan. This is a CT scan, the bone appears white and the spinal cord appear gray and compare the intervertebral disc spaces. Here, normal, but here between L5, S1, there is narrowing of the intervertebral disc space. In uh, MRI, the bone appear gray, while the spinal cord appear white. And uh, MRI, very, very important to detect this. What is this? Compression of spinal cord and compression of coda appear best in MRI. Uh, the importance of MRI is compression on the spinal canal appear clearly as this intervertebral disc space compressing the spinal canal. What is the treatment of intervertebral disc prolapse? According in lumbar vertebrae, uh, conservative measures, uh, usually effective, which is uh, complete rest uh, in bed, uh, on firm mattress for about two to four weeks with analgesics and physiotherapy exercise with weight reduction and avoid flexion strain um, surgery if conserved treatment fail or there is obvious motor and the sensory manifestations. Um, the aim of uh, surgery is removal of the prolapsed nucleus bulbosus. How to remove uh, the prolapsed nucleus bulbosus? Recently, and the commonest technique, which is the most minor technique, is endoscopic microdiscectomy through an endoscope 
<coughs> the tissues between the lamina is dissected and through the endoscope we remove the prolapsed material um, in the bus and this is becomes less popular is laminectomy excision of the spinous process this is a normal spinous process and this is called right and left lamine laminectomy include removal of the two lamine with the spinous process to enter the spinal canal and remove the prolapsed material um, we may uh, perform a laminectomy or hemilaminectomy. Removal of the lamina only on one side may be enough. This is in case of lumbar disc prolapse. But uh, in cervical disc prolapse, mainly conservative physiotherapy and analgesics and the color. If there is manifestation of spinal cord compression, one of the following can be done which is anterior cervical discectomy and the spinal fusion. This is the most common technique nowadays. Through an anterior approach, we reach uh, the intervertebral disc space and remove the, the disc. Remove the herniated disc and after removal of the herniated disc through a small anterior incision uh, on the anterolateral aspect of the neck we reach the disc space remove the disc and never remove the disc and this is the end no we put between the two adjacent vertebrae a bone graft followed by a plate is applied to fix the two vertebrae together. Uh, filling the empty space between the two adjacent vertebrae after removal of the disc is essential. If the two vertebrae becomes adherent directly together without a disc, this leads to narrowing of the intervertebral foramen with compression of the nerve bus in this foramen. It is better nowadays, like this, like this exactly. But after removal of the affected disc, we remove the affected disc and we insert instead of bone graft, we insert an artificial disc between the two vertebrae. Here the disc is removed and we insert this artificial disc between the two vertebrae or like lumbar microdiscectomy in the cervical region we dissect the space between the two lamina and through an endoscope we remove the prolapsed nucleus bulbosus uh, this is called endoscopic posterior cervical microdiscectomy, similar to the lumbar microdiscectomy. This is uh, the intervertebral disc prolapse. Thank you for good listening and good luck.